again uh, ready for the third uh, sh uh, lecture, Swiss Games Showcase lecture. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my colleague Tanya and I, we will run the show uh, later on with Jason De La Rocca. Um, maybe real quick, some, some, some information for you uh, about the Swiss Game Showcase, because uh, we we do have some updates, uh, um, but before I gonna give you uh, some information, um, um, please mute your microphone. And if you have questions during the lecture, put them in the comment section. I like to do that. Put them in the comment section and uh, or wait till uh, till till the end. We do, we're gonna do a Q and A session at the end of the session. All right. Uh, what's next? Um, uh, just uh, real quick about the timetable, uh, some information from our side, from Provizio, then uh, uh, the lecture starring Jason De La Roca, and then we do a half an hour Q&A session for you guys. Uh, talking about very important stuff, uh, we, we had to reorganize the two lectures a little bit. So uh, there are two lectures with two new dates. So please be aware of the new dates for the, the one lecture with Jamil. We had to move it, uh, move it to uh, the 24th of February. And then uh, another one, the matchmaking lecture with Fedor van Herpen um, uh, will be on the 17th, 5 p.m. till 6.30 p.m. And so now let's head forward to the tonight's lecture uh, starring Jason De La Roca. I, uh, you got, you guys are much more better, much better uh, with the with the design uh, uh, job, I guess, than I am. But uh, yeah, okay. Um, tonight, uh, starring Jason Del Roca. Um, Jason, before we start, maybe uh, let me give the audience some information about you. Oh. Most important, you are actually, I guess, one of the most loyal and most important, and for sure, one of the dearest supporters of Provincia and Swiss Games. Is this true? Before I. Listen, I, 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 as long as you feed me chocolate, I'll just keep coming back. It's like I'm, I'm a bad raccoon or something, you know. It's how many years? When did you start working for Provincia? You know oh, that. I don't, oh, I don't. Oh, uh, jeez, I don't know. It's six, seven years. I mean, oh. uh, I, I was at the, I think the first Ludicious, maybe first or second one, and 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 before that was uh, one of the one of the i think it was the second call for funding of games so yeah. when when was that actually it was before my time so i guess it was like yeah it might be 7 8 years ago yes yeah so yeah. I, I have a bad memory but yeah we're we're going back uh, yeah 7 8 years give but it's good it's actually great to hear it doesn't feel that long for you that's it's actually good news <laughs> that's good news for us so uh, just my last la slide, some hard facts about uh, Jason La Roca, activities, game industry entrepreneur, founding advisor, cluster expert, early stage investor, back in the days. And then very important topics, business partnerships, development, pitching, funding, ecosystem, cluster development, and for sure, as you already told us, <laughs> with chocolate. Perfect. So uh, please uh, take it away, Jason. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and, and you know, I, I've... Uh... I, I don't know. I, I just, I just uh, a fan of the the Swiss scene. I think this is just a nice vibe. And uh, w what's interesting, I think I've said this last time, was uh, the evolution of the projects, the evolution of the projects, evolution of the teams, uh, and the scale and sort of ambition of, of everyone. It's really nice to see things evolve over time. Uh, you know, and, and quality of the games getting better every year. Uh, and and success, you know, more and more success happening too. So it's kind of, it, it's just nice to sort of follow along and kind of see how those things evolve over time. Uh, all right, so I will share my screen. All right, give me a thumbs up. Does that look good? It's okay? Yeah, all right. Uh, <clears throat> so, so uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think most people know who I am and, and, and I, I won't spend too much time on myself. Uh, just sort of importantly, uh, you know, that, that I do end up working with a lot of game studios all over the world. Uh, th that, that tends to be focused on the funding and pitching side of things and kind of scoring investors and working with publishers and, uh, and so on. Uh, and just sort of overall business strategy. 
And, and one of the biggest challenges is discoverability. Uh, you know, I, I don't think this is a mystery to anyone, but, but the reason why I'm talking about it, because I'm not a designer, uh, is, is because this is often a problem when we're talking about funding and publishers. Is there, you know, the investors, the publishers themselves are trying to pre-solve the discoverability question for your game. Meaning if they, if they invest or if they publish your game, do they believe it will be discoverable? Because that's obviously what they're trying to do as, you know, as the publisher. And so oddly enough, it's kind of required me to sort of think about this, uh, this issue uh, uh, because it's sort of a hurdle to, to trying to get funding and, uh, and achieve success. All right, so, uh, you know, I'm not the only one to think this way. Uh, this is a great quote from uh, our buddy, uh, Chris Charla who's the head of the uh, ID at Xbox group, uh, or sorry, the ID group at Xbox, which is like their indie support initiative, uh, where essentially he's saying like, hey man, I, I, I think that discoverability is the harder challenge than even investment. Uh, and this, this I, I believe he said this at an investment summit. Uh, so I grabbed that and thought, yeah, well, you know, like, like that's really uh, interesting that he's bringing it up. So why is that? Again, uh, uh, you know, all, all developers, all content creators should be fairly familiar with this challenge. It's really just, uh, you know, flood of content, right? Ba barriers to entry, to get onto Steam, to publish something on the App Store, you know, even to get on the consoles uh, is relatively easy. And, and so there is a flood of content. Uh, and so then the challenge becomes, how do I get noticed? How do I get discovered? Uh, amidst uh, that that flood of content. And so as a creator, as a developer, you cannot just focus on making a game and launching it, right? Just like so many developers around the world really only see their task as making the thing. And then, okay, I just push the button and it's out there in the world and then whatever happens, happens. Uh, not not everyone's like that. Of course, some developers are are savvy and think through marketing and, and understand these challenges. But you'd be surprised how many developers around the world still see that ah, my my job is to make the thing, and my job is to make the thing beautiful, and my job is to make the thing fun, and you know whatever happens happens. But there's that sort of you know kind of joke of uh, you know if you if if you released a game on Steam and no one noticed it, did you really release a game on Steam? You know, it's it's kind of this uh, you know the tree falling in the woods uh, uh, dilemma, and so and so we all think about marketing and the challenge around marketing. There's a great lecture at GDC a couple of years ago. I don't know if this one's behind the GDC paywall or the GDC vault uh, paywall or not. Uh, you know, some of them are free, some of them are not. Um, but it was called uh, Awesome Video Game Data 2017. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a few years old, this one. Uh, and it was um, uh, uh, Gregory Zetkin from EDAR, uh, EDAR being, uh, you know, one of those uh, data firms, analyst firms, similar to Nuzu uh, and NPD and so on. Uh, and he, he had, uh, I mean, the, the lecture is chock full of, you know, charts and graphs and, you know, whatever, pipe, like a really dense lecture, but this is the slide that really got my attention, uh, marketing versus game quality. So if we, if we look at the graph, uh, the, the bottom axis, uh, the horizontal axis is the review score. So kind of game quality or a proxy for game quality. And then the vertical axis is uh, marketing spend. Uh, and, um, uh, and so then he, he, he graphed a, a bunch of game releases uh, during that 2012, 2016 timeframe. And, and not surprisingly, you know, top quality games that had a lot of marketing sold well. So that's the green 83 million uh, uh, block quadrant. Uh, so make a good game, spend a lot of money on marketing and, you know, you'll make good profits. Uh, and, then, and then sort of the reverse, make a crappy game and don't do much marketing and you'll not make much money. So the red 5 million block. So those... Yeah, that, that seems obvious, uh, the red and the green. The other two gray blocks, well, that's the more interesting, uh, uh, the, the more interesting quadrants. So on the one hand, make a great game and, but you know, don't do much marketing and you make 14 million or 15 million, almost 15. And, and a bit sadly, if you make a crap game, but market the hell out of it, you'll make twice as much. So that's the 29 million. 
right? So that, that's a bit depressing as a developer, right? So I, I can make a great game, but just not have the resources to push it. And, you know, I'll still generate 14 million, but, but those yahoos that made a crappy game that just went bonkers to market it, they make double the money uh, that, that I did. Uh, obviously, the, the winning strategy here is make a great game and do good marketing and, you know, we'll all be rich. Uh, and, and of course, avoid making a crappy game uh, and you'll suffer. Uh, but, but it really sort of speaks to this dilemma of, of the impact uh, of, of marketing, uh, you know, the, that marketing has on, on game, game success or game, game results. Um, so that I thought was really fascinating. I, again, it's a bit older data. It'd be really interesting to see if he kind of reran that based on today's numbers with the impact of Twitch and influencers and stuff like that. But um, anyway, so, so I, I've kind of saw this firsthand. Uh, a few years ago, uh, one of the studios uh, we invested in with Execution Labs was called um, Throughline Games. They made uh, a story game called Forgotten Anne, and uh, it was a beautiful game, sort of very, very anime. Uh, it was like it was like a playable Miyazaki movie. It was just gorgeous, gorgeous, and it won tons of of awards. I mean. I think the lowest score it ever got was the 8.5, and it was just sort of accolade after accolade after accolade uh, and, and rave reviews. So, so uh, you know, beautiful game, uh, massive critical success, uh, but was a total bomb uh, commercially. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. Uh, you, you know, one that it was a relatively short, relatively linear uh, a narrative focused game, which you know, tends to struggle in today's market with the impact of Twitch, but we'll, we'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, but also they had very limited marketing, right? So they had, they, had they, they, they were in the sort of the bottom gray quadrant, right? A great game, award-winning game, but, but just not that much resources to, to push it, to market it. Uh, and, and they also kind of fell in the trap of a developer being overconfident because they were getting all of this praise and winning awards and going to shows and winning festivals. And so they just assumed that, uh, you know, those accolades would translate into sales. And so they wouldn't really have to worry so much about marketing because, because what they were creating was so great. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and we went along for that ride and we didn't sort of pressure them quite enough to do it anyways. And so unfortunately, you know, the game was a commercial, uh, failure. I, I mean, since launch, I think they, they did a switch version in a mobile, so, you know, it, it's, it's sort of recovered from the initial, uh, um, sort of, uh, non-success, but, uh, but be beautiful game. Uh, and so, you know, when we see scenarios like that, we assume, okay, we just need to shout louder. Right. We just need to get some more of that marketing money. We just need to shout and tell people, you know, hey, our, our beautiful thing exists. Come buy it. Uh, and 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 it's it's somewhat of a viable approach. But the issue is shouting about your game is never enough. Uh, and Ubisoft will always shout louder than you, right? Sony with the next God of War will always shout louder. The next Grand Theft Auto will be shout shouting louder than you cyberpunk shouting louder than you and so certainly as independents shouting loud is a very hard strategy and or extremely expensive to be able to compete at the level of shout volume that exists you know with all the triple a and larger uh, larger productions uh, and so shouting is is sort of not a, a great plan uh all right let's look at what does marketing actually mean and marketing is, is more than PR. And I think a lot of developers, when you ask them, well, what is marketing? They'll be like, oh yeah, well, that's when I talk to the game press and you know, send out my, my uh, press kit and you know, try, try to get some, 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 some articles about my game. Right? The, many, many developers all over the world, you ask them marketing and they're saying kind of PR promotion type things. But the reality is that, that marketing is much broader than that. If you open up, you know, any textbook, classical textbook on marketing, uh, they have this concept of the, the four P's uh, of marketing, uh, which are, are promotion, place, price, and product. Uh, so promotion, that's really the PR piece, right? Sending out press releases, you know, getting attention for the game, um, you know, buying ads, you know, whatever the case may be, that, that's promotion. So that's one aspect, one, one quarter of what marketing is. Uh, place. Uh, I mean, traditionally it's, uh, you know, I'm going to open a cafe. 
So should I open the cafe on this side of the street or that side of the street or this part of town or that part of town? Where is there more foot traffic near near the train station, not near the train station? So like it's physical place. Uh, in, in our context, place, you know, you can think of it more as like distribution or, or platform, right? Do I release on Apple? Do I release on Switch? Should I do a, you know, VR uh, for VR platforms or, or console or, you know, like, so it's like, wh where will my game be, be available? Which platforms? Uh, price. So all the questions around business model and pricing and discounting and uh, you know, think thinking about uh, is it paid DLC or free DLC? Do I do proper free to play or you know ad driven or not? All these questions around business model and pricing is a really important question uh, of marketing. And then finally, product. So the actual design and thinking of the product itself is part of the marketing equation. Uh, is part of marketing strategy, thinking through, well, what are we building and for who and, and, and what are the features and, you know, what, what do we need to design to have uh, success in the market? All these questions around product are, in fact, part of marketing. And so I would actually say all game design is marketing in, in a very sort of broad sense. And so, uh, you know, all, all of you uh, designers out there that feel kind of dirty when you talk about marketing or think, oh, I'm a designer, I'm an indie developer. I don't, you know, I don't want to taint myself with all that talk of marketing. You are in effect a marketer. All of you here listening now are marketers. If you are doing game design uh, and game development, you are in fact, in fact, doing uh, marketing because you are answering questions around the product, the price, place, platform, all this kind of stuff. Um, all right. So, so now that we've all accepted that everyone here is in marketing. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna proceed. Um, so so uh, the main sort of uh, thesis of the presentation is that discoverability needs to be baked into the game design, right? So discoverability is often seen as a marketing challenge. Game design, we've just agreed that game design is part of the marketing equation, and so we need to think of discoverability from the game design uh, perspective. Uh, and so that's where we come up with this sort of concept of design for discoverability. Uh, before we dive into games, I'll give you a real world example of design for discoverability. This is a photo I took uh, when I was on vacation in Barcelona a couple of years ago uh, of, of, a, of a little cafe, a breakfast cafe called Brunch and Cake. I never knew existed. I had, I had no idea what this place was. Uh, uh, you know, it was a Sunday morning uh, in, in Barcelona and my partner says, uh, all right, Sunday, we're going to brunch and cake to have, well, brunch. I'm like, what, what, what do you mean? What is this? What, how, what's going on? And she was like, well, you know, there's this lovely uh, brunch place. It's not too far from here. Let's, let's walk over there. Uh, and, and, and get our brunch. And, and I said, well, you know, how, how did you find out about this? She goes, oh, well, I was, you know, I, I was searching uh, or looking on Instagram and I saw this lovely picture with all these beautiful flowers in that window. I wanna go sit in that window and take a picture uh, so I can post it to my Instagram of this lovely brunch that I'm gonna have in Barcelona on our vacation. I'm like, okay, I guess we're going to brunch and cake for, for, for breakfast. So we trek across town and what's not seen in this photo is the massive queue of all the other people who had the exact same idea and were lined up to go have their, their brunch uh, at brunch and cake. So, uh, so we went up the street and had pancakes instead. But, um, so I didn't actually get to enjoy a, a, a breakfast at brunch and cake because it was too popular. Um, and so you have to wonder, you know, is this by accident or was this design and these colors and those flowers and how they framed the windows and everything they've done designed that way to have that exact effect of those pictures getting onto Instagram and where, you know, whatever other social medias to have that very precise effect of allowing that place to be discovered versus all other potential brunch places uh, in, in Barcelona. Um, and so, uh, so that was design for discovery, uh, you know, baked in, uh, you know, from the very conception of the, of the space. So when I talk about design for discovery, this is the kind of stuff, uh, that, that I'm talking about. And so that's a good strategy for a brunch cafe, uh, in, in a tourist town. Uh, all right. So, uh, 
I do have a kind of a taxonomy of different techniques. And so we're going to go through uh, four different sort of broad categories of, of uh, design for discoverability techniques. And I've got a bunch of, uh, uh, of examples from, from real games uh, and, and how they've used it. Uh, and then what I might do is I may pause there and take some questions on the techniques uh, and then resume on some, some stuff of how that applies to community building. Because uh, it, otherwise it's kind of a long uh, chunk of time just listening to me. Uh, talk. Uh, all right, so so li listen, this taxonomy is just me making stuff up, right? So this is not, you know, no one wrote a book on this. It's not like like no academics have officially sanctioned these categories or whatever. So it's still kind of work in progress. I'm still sort of ma making it up. Um, all right, so the first broad category in design for discoverability is what I'm calling memetic shareability or kind of uh, something that's memeable uh, in, in that sense. Um, and, and then e each broad category has a, a handful of sub uh, techniques. Um, so the first technique in, in mimetic shareability is uh, the quirky hook. Uh, and a great example here of a quirky hook is um, uh, that goose, un untitled goose game, which is just so bizarre, so quirky, so cute. Uh, that people just ended up tweeting about it and 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 doing memes and and taking photos and posting stuff. I mean, like it ended up on newspaper covers and uh, like celebrities were tweeting about. It. Like it was it just unbelievably that you could not have predicted the kind of memeability of it. But it, it was just this sort of bizarre quirkiness uh, that that kind of ha had that effect. And and certainly the game was designed with that effect uh, in in mind. I mean, they didn't obviously anticipate that level of success, but uh, it was definitely a part of their approach. Uh, stunning art is another technique where the game is just so ridiculously beautiful that people have to share with their friends. I think uh, Greece is an example of a game uh, that had success and was shared and talked about so extensively because of the gorgeous art. Uh, I think Sable is another example of that uh, when it was first announced. Um, Ublitz, you know that that game grew in popularity originally because of uh, the, the art style that it had, uh, and got got so many followers. Uh, and and every every like image or little animated gif they posted, uh, uh, you know, everyone just talked about the amazing art. Um, and then uh, a couple of years ago, there was a, a cool cool game called Falcon Age. Uh, and we actually had the developer of Falcon Age give a lecture here in Montreal uh, about two years ago. And, and they were saying that when they released uh, cute art of the Falcon when it was a little baby, the engagement they had uh, in their social channels was massive. Whereas when they showed other screenshots of the environment or, or the older Falcons or whatever, like the engagement uh, of, of, of the art wasn't as high. And so they kind of you know, adjusted the game and had more stuff with the cute baby Falcon. And, and, and so the, the, the effect of the art sort of drove some, some design, design decisions as well. Um, all right, so so the art itself is part of that, you know, memeable, memeable share or sharing. Um, the third uh, technique for mimetic shareability is the animated GIFs or replay exports. And I think uh, a great example here is uh, uh, Opus Magnum from Zaktronix, uh, where, where, you know, you're solving these very complex puzzles and the solutions themselves are quite visually stunning. Uh, and then they had tools that allowed you to kind of export and tweet and stuff. And, uh, and, and uh, Zach, probably with the best headline of any game industry news article, uh, you know, expressed this as our marketing was making the game shit out gifts that everyone would put on Twitter. Uh, and and, and that, that, like, that was their strategy. Like they had no other marketing plans other than make something where, where people would want to share uh, those animated gifts, uh, and then and then of course a uh, shout out uh, to uh, Philomena and uh, and Strafon, Strafon and and um, uh, you know their work with Nim Nimbatus. Uh, I, you know I, I I think I think the 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 quality of the visuals for these animated gifts were played a massive role in that game's uh, success successful Kickstarter. Uh, and sort of just the transportability of the game as people just saw this sort of juicy pixel effects and shared it with all their friends and, and, and sort of had success on Reddit and Imager and all that kind of stuff. So, so a, a great example from a local, uh, local studio. 
Um, there was uh, there was actually a good lecture at GDC a couple of years ago uh, from from this game uh, Polybridge, where they essentially the whole lecture was about how they leveraged replays and and shareability uh, of the game, um, uh, and how they built a replay system and designed the game to sort of uh, really focus on replays, uh, and how that enabled them to build community and find success. Uh, and how people were playing and watching and and sharing replays and so on. So uh, a great uh, lecture, uh, about, probably about two, three years ago uh, from Polybridge. Uh, all right, and then the last category or last technique in mimetic shareability uh, is, is the genre-like. Um, and so this is, uh, you know, games that are similar to other games that are very popular, right? So, so City Skylines, as an example, uh, you know, a lot of its early success is attributable to, uh, you know, fans of SimCity seeing another city builder game and saying, oh, I like that. That's the genre style that's, you know, what I like to play. And so that enables city skylines to more easily uh, be discovered. And certainly on, on Steam itself, you know, there are algorithms there that are looking at the, the genre and feature tags and seeing, you know, which games are similar to which other games uh, and so if you're, you know, maybe this is a bad example. I don't know if SimCity is even available on Steam, but if I'm looking at the SimCity Steam page, you go down to the section that says more games like this and you see City Skylines. And so the algorithm is actually helping you be discovered because you're genre-like. Um, you know, then, then you have, you know, the whole category of Animal Crossing and Stardew Valley and Harvest Moon, right? I think, I think in part, the success of each of those games propels the success of the other games in that, in that category. Um, and, then, and then combining a whole bunch of this stuff, there, there was a really interesting uh, game called uh, Midboss, uh, which was a procedurally generated uh, roguelike style game. Uh, and they did something really interesting where uh, when you would die in the dungeon, it would pop up this like death card, uh, you know, it's with your name and what level you were and how many turns and a little sort of snippet of what you achieved. Uh, and then you can kind of automatically tweet that. Uh, and that if someone was looking at it, they were able to grab the image and import it into their game uh, because the uh, the level information was encoded into like the dead sort of portion of the image file. Uh, and so you were able to load this into your game and kind of play to the same spot that that person died. And then the loot was like there for you to grab. Uh, and so it became, uh, that was a really interesting little technique, not only for people to kind of share, say, oh, I made it to level 1000, but then as a, as, a, as a sort of tool to sort of grab and import into your game and replay and, and stuff like that. So it was a really kind of interesting uh, uh, approach of this sort of uh, shareability. All right, uh, next high level category in my uh, totally made up taxonomy uh, is intrinsic shareability. So first category, mimetic, second category, intrinsic shareability. Uh, and so here now the examples are uh, much more embedded in the actual game mechanics, uh, right? So here the example is Forza, uh, where I can issue challenges to my friends, right? So I do a, a, a you know, speed attack or, or a great lap on a particular track, uh, and then I can challenge all my friends uh, to try to you know beat my time or, or race alongside me and stuff like that. So so uh, uh, you know the mechanics of the game, the gameplay itself is enabling me to go tell all my friends, come play with me, come try to beat my 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 best times and stuff. So is a form of of uh, of, sh of sharing and and virality. Um, slightly differently, uh, next category is requesting help. Uh, and I think the best example here is, um, you know, some of the original uh, uh, Facebook slash mobile games like Candy Crush, right, where, where you know, when you run out of hearts, you, you, you annoy the hell out of all your Facebook friends to uh, send you more hearts so you can keep playing. Um, and uh, I, I think Farmville had some mechanics like that, too. You ran out of something and you, you were able to ask all your fa uh, Facebook friends for help and stuff like that. So, um, so again, that's another sort of, you know, built-in intrinsic tool uh, in the mechanics themselves that are, that are giving you an excuse to go, well, in this case, kind of annoy your friends, but go, go ask your friends for, for help. 
Um, another form of intrinsic uh, uh, shareability is uh, referral perks, a little bit different. Uh, here, the example is EVE Online, where uh, if I recruit a friend into the game, uh, you know, I get a, a million skill points. I, I'm, I'm not an EVE Online player, so I don't know how valuable a million skill points are, but, you know, that's a lot of zeros, so I assume that's pretty valuable. Uh, and so once again, you know, the game itself uh, is, is encouraging me to bring my friends into the game. Um, War World of Warcraft, at least a few years ago, did something similar where if you brought a friend into the game, uh, I think you got some like rare mount or familiar or something like that. So there's like a reward for you. And so if you really wanted that rare mount, well, then you're telling all your friends about, wow, you know, come play, come sign up, come be part of my guild and we'll all get, you know, rare mounts and stuff. Um, so again, this is another form of kind of intrinsic uh, sharing. Um, and then, and then again, in the same sort of genre, uh, this idea of friend buffs. So now, uh, you know, the gameplay is affected whether or not I have friends in the game. And this is a, an old game uh, uh, called Stronghold, uh, where you're, you know, you're, you're sieging castles. Um, and if I had no friends, when I siege a castle, I was limited to 300 troops. But if I had friends in the game, I was able to borrow 200 troops from a friend so that I could attack a castle or siege a castle with 500 friends. So it's kind of like an automatic buff uh, uh, that I can, I, I can add, you know, a huge amount of troops uh, and have more success when I siege a, an enemy castle. So once again, encouraging me to tell my friends to have them in the game because I want to get those 200, you know, buff uh, or, or troops as a, as a buff on my, on my sieges. Um, there was a mobile game uh, called uh, Puzzle and Dragons uh, out of Japan. Uh, uh, I mean, worldwide, of course, but uh, hugely successful. I mean, th this was one of the original, you know, like games that was making hundreds of millions of dollars free to play on mobile a couple of years ago. Um, and, and a fairly basic, you know, dungeon crawler uh, type of game, very casual. Well, I'm, I'm kind of casual, but you know, a good game. The real devious thing about Puzzle and Dragons is that uh, one of your dragon slots had to be filled by a friend's dragon. So when you went into the dungeon, you sort of picked which of your, 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 uh, your uh, dragons you wanted to go with you into the dungeon. And the final slot had to be a friend's dragon. Uh, and, 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 and there was a whole sort of system that as, as, so I borrow a friend's dragon, I go do dungeons, as I collect loot and rewards and level up, the French dragon levels up and my friend gets certain bonuses and perks for having borrowed me the dragon. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I don't remember all the little details of how that system worked, uh, but there was, there, was a, there was a strong kind of uh, uh, motivation for me to have friends in the game to, uh, and required to use a French dragon. Uh, I wanted my friends to use my dragons so that they leveled up faster. And there was a whole kind of reward system that, that kind of accelerated uh, uh, that, that, that process. So, so, you know, real kind of simple thing like, oh, the last slot has to be a friend's dragon, uh, created this massive amount of social glue, uh, and, and, and kind of virality as people, uh, kind of borrowed each other's dragons and leveled up each other's dragons and stuff. So, um, th there was, there was a good, um, a good write-up at, uh, Deconstructor of Fun. If you Google Deconstructor of Fun Puzzle and Dragons, you'll see like their, their, case study and there's a whole section on the that sort of that whole system of of the french dragon and so on like that um all right so third high level category my taxonomy this is a terrible label i need to come up with a better word for this uh, but we'll just go with watchability for now this is all stuff related to uh, streaming uh and uh and online uh, video action um all right so first technique in watchability is what I'm calling viewer buffs. Uh, and this is where your spectators actually have uh, uh, or, or, or can buff you as you play or as the streamer plays. So here's a screenshot of Rage 2. Uh, Rage 2 had a feature that if I'm playing the game as I'm streaming it, so let's say I'm a famous streamer and I'm on Twitch and I'm streaming the game, if I die, my fans watching me can revive me. 
uh, and I and I can kind of keep keep playing. So it was kind of a a, a, re, a revival mechanism. Um, yeah. So so just one example. There's a, there's a lot more of this kind of stuff that's starting to to pop up using the Twitch uh, extensions. Um, sort of deeper than that is the idea of integrated play. Uh, you know, a few examples here, something like uh, Jackbox uh, Party, right? It's kind of like you're playing and it's sort of integrated with the video uh, and streaming effect. Um, there was a, a really fun game a few years ago called Streamline, which was one of the first games ever to have spectator sort of integration in the game. Uh, and it was kind of like an arena shooter-ish on rollerblades. And as, the, as, the, 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 as you're watching the stream, you could sort of vote on, uh, you know, whether the floor was lava or ice, uh, you know, whether there were certain weather effects or obstacles, uh, you know, what the prizes were. And so, so the, the spectators had an ability to affect uh, ga gameplay and, and sort of vote on certain things. Uh, and then there was a, another sort of one of the other earlier experiments called the Darwin Project, uh, which had a whole spectator mode and how the audience could have a, a, a deep effect on, uh, on what was happening uh, in, in the game. Um, and then even more recently, uh, last year, uh, 2020, Ubisoft uh, released, it, released a game called Hyperscape. Uh, and, and it's sort of like the, the, the steroids version of, uh, of um, Streamline, uh, where, where they're really presenting it as a game that you play while you're streaming and that all the spectators can vote on things and different parameters and set challenges and all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we're starting to see more, more and more of that. Uh, all right. Next watchability technique is what I'm calling expert play. And so this is where, uh, uh, you, you know, there's, there's, there's a real high degree of expertise and proficiency in playing the game uh, that people are exporting or streaming uh, and, 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 you, and you are just mesmerized by it. So I mean, I, I'm using here uh, my, my friend Pedro uh, as an example where there's this really sort of ballet style of violence where you, know, you throw up a frying pan and shoot it and the bullets ricochet to kill the enemies and you backflip on a skateboard. And you know, it's just mesmerizing to watch, watch that stuff and, uh, and, and want to see the expert, experts play. I think, I think Rocket League is another example of that or, or, or you see that of course with uh, you know, a lot of the, the shooter games and uh, you know, Fortnite or whatever, but uh, you know, Rocket League, just watching the proficiency of some of those players is just unbelievable what they can kind of get that car to do to hit the ball and, and so on. So, so you know, when you have a game that encourages that level of play, then you have a high degree of, of watchability and, and people sort of sharing their, their expert play. Uh, another category or another technique in watchability is uh, optimized broadcasting, uh, where you are really making an effort to ensure that uh, the game is, is uh, sort of specifically built or optimized to be broadcast. Uh, I, I think a great example here is Beat Saber, uh, where the developer really put in extra effort to enable this kind of VR streaming with the kind of green screen effect. Uh, and and I really attribute a lot of the success of that game to the effort that they put into making sure this worked and the game was streamable. Uh, because if it was just sort of the VR view streaming on Twitch, that really would not have been compelling. Uh, and and if it was up to the user to set up a green screen whole you know scenario, not so many players are able to do that. And so the fact that he built sort of specialized broadcasting tools to facilitate that. Uh, I think r r really helped the game to, uh, to, to, to succeed. Um, there's not too many examples of this and it's very case specific, but, uh, but when it happens, uh, it usually has a, a great, uh, great impact. Uh, and then we're even seeing examples where uh, the, the game can only be played on Twitch. So this is a screenshot from uh, Twitch, uh, Twitch Sings. Uh, which was a, a, a game specifically designed and commissioned by Twitch. Uh, Harmonix was the developer. So Harmonix famously, of course, is the developer that did that originally made Rock Band and Guitar Hero and, and, and a bunch of other sort of music and, and, and singing games. Uh, and so they made, you know, a karaoke challenge style game that is played on Twitch. Like you cannot play this game any other way than on Twitch, which, you know, is kind of cool and, and makes sense. Um, there's, there's, a, there's another one that literally just, just, just came out, I think, before the holidays called Rival Peak. Uh, but that wasn't on Twitch. That was done over Facebook. 
uh, Facebook video where where that game is only playable through the Facebook video system. Um, and then in a way, I mean, among us, it's not it's not specifically or only playable over Twitch, but I, I mean, it's really kind of built for that. And, and you can see the success that that has in creating a game that really is uh, designed in a way to leverage the uh, the impact of, of streamers and, and the Twitch effect. Uh, even though Among Us itself is a relatively small, you know, project, uh, the level of success is, is, is mind-boggling. All right. Uh, the final uh, high-level category of, uh, of uh, design for discoverability uh, is what I'm calling sociability. Again, terrible label. I need to come up with a better label. Uh, but uh, so this is, this is kind of all stuff that... Um, uh, you know, like Metcalf's law is, is, is important, right? So Metcalf's law is the, the, the value of a network increases exponentially with each new sort of member or unit in, in the network. Uh, so this kind of power law curve as, as communities uh, scale. Um, and so the first, first technique here is really uh, status, right? So things like leaderboards and rankings and badges and all that kind of stuff where, where you as a community member are able to uh, you know, show off your standing and show off your achievements uh, and get on top of the leaderboard and be recognized for accomplishments and so on. Now, this doesn't work for all games. Uh, uh, obviously, this makes sense mainly for competitive games uh, or PvP games. Uh, but, uh, you know, even, even if you look at something like um, games that are suitable for, for uh, um, speedruns, right, having a speedrun leaderboard you know, it's sort of a nice social meta activity that enables you to, to have status without it necessarily being you're shooting each other's heads off or whatever. Um, another uh, technique within sociability is the, the water cooler effect. Uh, and I'm actually going to use a, a non-game example because I think it's so powerful. Uh, well, I, uh, I guess most people know what Lost is. <laughs> I, I don't know how, how much it played in Europe and, and I guess it is a few years old now, but um, certainly when Lost came out, over here, it was so mesmerizing, this so mysterious, so so much complexity in the story and so many characters. And, you know, why were they on the island? And what was the black sp smoke creature? And why was the, you know, what was the hatch and the button? And uh, I mean, it, it was just so, so dense with mystery and question marks that like the next day at work, you know, everyone was talking about it. What did you think? How did you interpret this? What you know? What did you think the smoke was, et cetera, et cetera? Uh, and so, if you were a bystander and hearing of all this sort of mystery and passion amongst the people at the water cooler, you you couldn't help but then have to go kind of consume the the content as well. And then and then even online, there was all kinds of forum blog posts about theories and breakdowns, and you know, taking every frame of the TV show and sort of you know analyzing it and. Uh, so, you know, can, can you create that sort of water cooler effect where everyone's talking about it uh, and discussing it so that other people are just swept away uh, in, in that effect? Um, not easy to do, but if you can, it's super, super powerful. Uh, and then uh, next uh, technique in sociability is what I'm calling wikification. And this is the idea that uh, people are going to build wikis uh, and, and uh, you know, create content to strategize about your game and create content for your game. Uh, I mean, I, I was a big player of Hearthstone for a while, uh, and, and, I, and I, I probably spent more time going through wikis on deck builds and strategies than I actually did playing the game. Um, you know, the, last year I played a lot of Borderlands, uh, Borderlands 3, and same thing, right? There's, there's a fairly complex grid of uh, skill and attribute points uh, uh, you know, to sort of create different builds of your characters because you only have a limited number of attribute points to allocate. Uh, and so you end up watching just nonstop uh, streams about, you know, here's what I did with this attribute that, that synchronized with this other attribute that synchronized with this particular weapon type if you want to be more of a sniper, or more of a brawler, or more of sneaking around or whatever. And, and, and in fact, uh, uh, you know, cyberpunk is the same thing right now, just as an example, where, where you have sort of a skill tree and attribute points and, and depending what style of play you want to do, you can kind of build your characters uh, in different ways. Uh, and the whole thing is that people are creating repositories of knowledge, whether it's on Twitch or, or, or YouTube or in wikis uh, to kind of put all those notes 
uh, down. And so that's sort of a valuable uh, discovery tool as people just kind of keep pouring out more and more uh, knowledge. Um, all right, next uh, technique in sociability is challenge scaling. Uh, and the best example really is the concept of raids, uh, right? So in World of Warcraft, there were these really sort of mon monumental uh, 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 bosses and challenges or raids that you couldn't just run in there on your own. You had to assemble a guild. You had to train and practice and strategize and, uh, and, and you know, whatever. You had, you had to plan for it, uh, which created that social glue, which meant that you were you know, telling your friends once again to join the game, to be part of the guild, and, and everyone is sort of encouraging each other to keep playing and keep leveling up because we're going to go do that raid. Uh, th this image uh, is a bit older. It's from the famous uh, Leroy Jenkins uh, incident where, where uh, this guild was planning, uh, you know, one of the raids, and then the character Leroy Jenkins got excited and just sort of ran into the dragon's den and caused absolute chaos, and that sort of became a meme of its own right. Um, a funny side note, when I was doing a bit of research on this, it was later discovered uh, that it wasn't spontaneous, that they actually planned it uh, and, and, uh, and that they did it specifically with the intent that it would become viral and then that would bring their clan attention so they can recruit more people to their, to, to their guild. Uh, so kind of a funny little twist there that this thing that we thought was so hilarious of this Leroy Jenkins guy just running in like a wacko, in fact, was totally uh, staged, but uh, uh, funny, funny story. Uh, all right. And then, and then sort of pulling some of those thoughts together, there was an RPG released last year or, or in, I guess, uh, 2019 uh, called Outward. Uh, this was actually from one of the studios that uh, we invested in. Uh, uh, the name of the studio is Nine Dots uh, here in Canada. Uh, and it's a sort of a Skyrim-ish type RPG, uh, obviously not quite the same scope as, as Skyrim, uh, but, but a, like, a, like a sort of somewhat realistic uh, survival style RPG where you're actually like setting up camp and, and uh, you know, you have to cook your food and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but they made some really interesting or weird design choices uh, in that like there was no map with navigation points. Uh, so, so you didn't know where you were in the world. You really had to navigate, you know, from the artifacts. Like, so I'm at the mountain with the curly thing on top, or I'm in the desert, or, uh, you know, like, like the map was not the normal style of map that we're, we're expecting in, in games. Uh, and also, uh, they did not have any information in terms of the food, how to cook your food, you know, recipes, nor did they have any information in the game about spells, and, and how the different uh, spell effects worked or combined. It was all sort of a mystery. So you were kind of discovering it as you played the game. Um, yeah, th this is, you know, I guess like when you're in the kitchen, you're cooking, I don't know, a stew or whatever that is. Uh, but what ended up happening was uh, uh, because the game was very uh, stingy with this information, people ended up kind of going down that wikification path that they were creating wikis now of the different recipes and the different spell effects. And, you know, if you want to have this, use these ingredients versus those ingredients. And, and something happened, which I'd never seen before, which was uh, regular players started streaming the game uh, quite often on Facebook, but obviously also on, on Twitch. And all of them would start by saying, hey, I'm just a regular gamer. I don't normally ever do this, or I've never done this before. But I, I want to contribute to the knowledge of the community, so I will stream my play session, and you can watch and take notes of where I am on the map, what ingredients I mix, and we can kind of like together decipher all the mysteries of this game. Uh, and so you had a whole bunch of quote unquote normal gamers who were who were streaming themselves uh, uh, as this kind of contribution of knowledge to the to the to the community. Uh, but guess what? I mean, that all then plays into the discoverability uh, and marketability of the of the game. So, a great great example from an indie studio, kind of uh, making some interesting design choices that that then had this uh, uh, sociability, uh, um, you know, water cooler effect, wikification uh, effect in in the game. Uh, all right, so that was my lightning fast uh, set of examples of my of my design for discoverability taxonomy. Again, the four broad categories is, uh, you know, being memeable, 
you know, having intrinsic uh, shareability, uh, so things really baked into the game design directly, you know, optimizing for watchability, and then all the sociability uh, stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think what I, oh, uh, yeah, okay, I, I think I'll, I'll pause there for a moment uh, and take uh, any, any kind of questions specifically on those techniques. Uh, and then, and then, and then I'll kind of resume with some of the more community stuff and more, more meta stuff. So let me stop sharing my screen there for a moment. Uh, all right. So any, any questions on those sort of specific, uh, techniques or, or even just the kind of the logic of, uh, of that, uh, anyone, anyone want to, want to jump in or it was all too fast. <laughs> Don't be shy. Yes, Lucas, I'll... you want to go, Lucas, right? Or not? Okay, so... You didn't want no to... question at that point, no. Okay, sorry. Okay, all right. Well, I guess if there's there's no questions, then I'll, I'll just uh, I'll just resume. Uh, okay, sorry, Tabea. Unmute, sorry, please. I yeah. was trying to find out how to raise my hand in Zoom because I never had to, and I didn't find out. Anyways, so... Um, yeah, I really like the groups uh, that you and the different techniques that you pointed out. Uh, I have two questions. One is, would you try to spec uh, or like focus on one and just try to get as good as possible with one, for example, just have perfect graphics so people share your wonderful graphics or would you mix and match? And the second question would be, um, would you say that all of them are equally working or are there kind of trends like for example now with the lockdown and the pandemic uh the sociable um group or something like that yeah yeah i mean to be a great uh you know great great questions um i i mean my my sense is that you want to mix and match a few techniques and, and the real answer is that it depends on what kind of game you're making. Uh, you know, when, I, when I've done, when I've talked about this before, a developer will say, oh my goodness, that's so many things I have to add to my game. Do I have to do all of it to have success? I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, like, like I mean, then, then it's going to be this nonstop game of sharing, tweeting, post it, like, like there's no gameplay. It's all just, you know, this stuff. Um, so, so, so there is some uh, sort of, a deep contemplation required to think about these techniques relative to your gameplay, relative to the game that you're building uh, and sort of what fits well. And that if it's one thing, if it's two things, if it's three things, uh, I think it really depends on, on, on the game. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, you still wanna create a fun experience, an engaging game. Uh, and the reality is that, that these techniques should be transparent to the user, meaning it, they, they shouldn't get a pop-up and they say, oh, great, here's the part where the developer wants me to help them market the game, right? It, rather, it should be, oh my, here's my chance to tell a friend. And if I get my friend to play with me, I'll double my troops when I go attack castles. Oh my goodness, well, I'm gonna call all my friends. Like, like, like they should not see it as a technique that you're doing to like, hey, hey buddy, go tell your friend so I can make more money. Um, so, so in that sense, you do have to be very thoughtful about how do you incorporate some of these things to actually make the game a more fun, more engaging uh, game. Um, so yeah, so more of a mix and match to your first uh, question. Uh, and then the second question in terms of trends, yeah, you're, you're spot on, right? I mean, certainly the effect of the lockdown is you want things that are more, uh, more cozy, uh, that allow you to engage with your friends. Uh, I think a lot more people have been streaming, so you're, you really... You really need to think about that watchability effect uh, or, or, or techniques that give a streamer an opportunity to directly engage and interact with their fans rather than just the fans watching and, and chatting. Um, you know, so, so th those trends are ever changing. Uh, and, you know, what may have been true 12 months ago may not be true 12 months from now. So once again, this is part of the designer challenge of thinking about the trends, the game I'm making, what's doing well, what's not doing well, which trend should I ride, and so on and so on. Um, and so, so you know, it sort of speaks to the earlier point that that product design is part of the marketing equation 
for these very reasons is that you 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 can't you you shouldn't be designing in a vacuum you should be designing relative to kind of what's happening uh in the world uh and then i think that's reflected then in which of these techniques you may lean on you know more more than than, than others uh but you know at the end of the day you, you still got to be a wicked creative smart designer developer uh in, in terms of uh of, of your game so cool but great 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 questions thanks to you all right. Anything else uh, before we move on? Uh, yeah, I, I guess if people don't know how to put their hand up or we're not seeing you, just unmute and. Yeah, I, I have a question. I managed to put up my hand. I'm really sorry. I don't have a camera. Oh, yeah, uh, right. uh, so, so my question would be that well, most of us are working on prototypes. Is are these um, features of the game something that you, as an investor, would like to see prototyped, or are you convinced if I find those two or three ingredients and put it on my roadmap that are a perfect fit to my game? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's uh, again, it's sort of, it depends, right? It depends on what the game is. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, th that, that was a tiller, right? That, that asked that question? Yes. Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so let, let's say for the car game, uh, you know, if, I, if I'm a publisher investor looking at the car game, I, I'm really initially at the prototype level evaluating the, the gameplay, right? Is this game fun to play? Does it have a good feel? Uh, and in that context, uh, you know, if, if on your roadmap you say, okay, well, we're going to have, uh, you know, some of these discoverability features, uh, you know, to assist in, in, in the sharing and virality of the game and so on, like, like that would probably be fine because I, I'm, I could imagine, all right, well, here's the core gameplay. And all right, there's a thing where I can trade my cars with my friends to increase value. Like, okay, I get it. There'll be an economy for cars. Okay, fine. That makes sense. But if the whole game was centered around like that kind of activity, I mean, let's say we use Among Us, you know, like, like if I imagine, imagine the developers of Among Us were trying to pitch to investors and say, we're creating this weirdly complex social game where you're trying to discover who's the killer, you know, and, 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 and there's people are going to be lying and trying to trick each other. Uh, and it's going to be amazing. But then I, I have none of that in my prototype, but that's what you're selling me then I'm going to be highly skeptical because the vi because that system is the very core of the game. Uh, and then you don't have anything to prove to me that that's working. So, so I, th I think, I think it's a question of how kind of core is, are, are these techniques to the actual sort of core of the game? And then you need to de-risk that and show that that's working. If it's more of, Oh, you know, I'm making candy crush and it's a fun match three. And then I have this idea of sharing hearts, you know, when you run out, you can go, you know, that's sort of a, a, a system that sits on top, then, then there's less of a risk there in terms of determining whether that's going to be fun or not. So uh, yeah, I don't know until if that kind of answers the question, but I guess it's really just how, how core is, are these techniques to the gameplay uh, and then needing to, to de-risk that to the, to the investor. Yeah, I think it's, uh, thank you. It makes sense. It's interesting what you were saying, because it makes sense that the, so certain games, these parts are core to the game, but I think for all the games, it's core to the success as you were describing in the in the introduction. So that's yeah. what I was asking. Yeah, cool, cool, cool. All right. So guys, uh, I saw that on your reaction, <laughs> the raise hand is just on my on my part. So you might have to just unmute yourself directly. You can do this. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I, I, it, it seems like Vlad is trying to connect to audio, but is not connected. I don't know if he had a question or not, but. Uh, no, uh, he's trying to connect uh, since <laughs> half an hour, more or less, he has okay. got. But okay. I have a quick question, Jason. Okay. Can I ask you regarding to these um, techniques? Is there a way of recognizing some techniques to refer to genre? Like, could you say like this genre of games has got like the tendency of, of 
including these three, four techniques? Mm. Is there a place where you can find this information or this doesn't make sense? Yeah, I, I, I mean, that, that should be part two of my lecture. Uh, <laughs> that, that's, a, yeah. that's a great idea. Uh, that information doesn't exist anywhere because I think I'm the only person that's sort of specifically talking about discoverability from sort of these techniques point of view. Okay. Um, so, so, I, so unfortunately, I don't think anyone else has done the like, well, let me go down each genre and sort of see which ones sort of align. Uh, but like quick off the top of my head, uh, you know, let's say if we're talking about an MMO, well, then it's, it's stuff like challenge scaling uh, and, and uh, all of the stuff related to guilds and referrals, right? Because an MMO, a big core concept of MMO stickiness is the guild. And so then you want to create systems that that encourage people to bring their friends into the guild. So then the buffs and the referral perks and 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 challenge scaling so that I need my guild to go kill the massive dragon because then I get the epic gear and uh, like those kinds of, of complementary systems would be well suited to uh, an MMO. Whereas let's say a, a PVP competitive game, well now it's stuff like ranking and expert play uh, maybe something like viewer buffs, you know, th these kinds of things, because the gameplay sort of lends itself to, to those, uh, to those kind of things. Or, uh, you know, with the RPG outward, it was much more about um, wikification, uh, uh, you know, sharing of knowledge, uh, and and the whole uh, water cooler effect, because there was a lot of mystery in the world that the details weren't there. So people wanted to sort of talk about it and say, hey, where did you go on the map? I went to this. What did you discover? Uh, I, you know, I saw the desert, but I was too scared to go in there. Did you go in the desert? And that created that water cooler effect. So 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 you're absolutely right that that certain kinds of game genres are are better suited to some of these techniques than others. Uh, but uh, I, I have not done the kind of the academic exercise of, you know, breaking it down genre by genre. So, um, but yeah, that, that would be good. All Thanks. right. And then uh, uh, Vlad did say he had uh, two questions. So I don't, I don't know if he's going to be able to ask those if his mic's not working, but. So. I don't know, Vlad, maybe put it in the, so... in the chat. Oh, my, oh, sorry, sorry, he meant no questions. Yeah, hi, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, but yeah, no, basically, I'm. I have two accounts connected right now. There's okay, two Vladislav. Yeah, okay, okay. So you, yeah, I, I transposed your your message. Uh, all right, okay. So, so I'll, I'll there, is, there is Paul. Uh, there is Paul yeah. Lucas as well. Right. Okay, okay, okay. Go ahead. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, like, would you say that any kind of humor is good for uh, discoverability, or uh, is there like? In our game, uh, humor will be something uh, kind of important. And is there like a good angle to approach it for more uh, discoverability that like you said? Uh, sorry, and you, and you said humor, correct? Uh, yeah, it's pretty hard to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I mean, so, so humor, is the same thing, like, imagine you said, oh, my game is fun. Is fun good for discoverability? Uh, well, now is, is humor good for discoverability? I, I think humor, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a challenging thing to do well in games. So if you have humor that, you know, in good humor, it sort of makes your game quite unique. But how does the humor help the game get discovered? You know, is it, is it like, you, I mean, I, I don't know, like you save the punchline and tweet it and saying, I laughed, I laughed so much at this joke in this game or... It's or, kind of uh, mimetic, uh, like for um, Entitled Goose Game. Yeah, but the, the point is, how do I turn humor in the game into something that's shareable? So, so you're right. I mean, humor and memes, obviously, you know, is sort of integrally, uh, conceptually combined. But, but, but how do I share that? Yeah. And, and so I think I think that's the challenge. Is like, uh, I think it's wonderful. Humor is great. Humor is, you know, if you can do it in game, it's super cool. If someone's playing it and laughing, that's good. But, but, but how does that get out to the rest of the world? What if I'm playing the game and laughing? What, what do I? What is it that I actually share? or tell my friends, you know, hey, I laugh so much at this game, come play it. 
mm-hmm. you know, so you have, you have to think about what, what those hooks are and, and, and what's shareable. And, and I mean, without seeing the game, it's not obvious yeah. to me how humor in and of itself uh, is sort of shareable in, in that sense. Um, all right. Thank you. Okay, so let, let me uh, move on. And we, obviously, at the end, we can kind of keep talking, but let me let me move on to the next uh, uh, portion, and I'll share my screen again. Uh, okay, so th- so once again, those were uh, my totally made up uh, high level taxonomy of uh, design techniques for discoverability. Uh, all right, so so um, going a little bit more meta, uh, sort of looking at things that. Uh, make your game less discoverable, which inherently also means probably less commercially viable, doesn't mean your game won't be fun. I mean, I'm talking about uh, commercial success, not just sort of quality or or fun level success. Um, But things or games that are single player isolated experiences, which usually means linear narrative or fixed content, kind of one solution, one ending, uh, uh, you know, these, these kinds of things inherently just become less discoverable because it's more like watching a movie, right? I play, it's, I'm by myself, I'm on my machine. I click, 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 save the world, the game's done. There's no strategies to share. There's no one to tell. There's no reason to have my friends in the game. It's single player. Uh, and, then, and then these things kind of rely primarily on promotional spending, which as we all know as indies, we just don't have huge uh, budgets to shout. Uh, if we look at that kind of on a spectrum, uh, you know, on the, on the sort of the potentially less discoverable, less commercially viable end of the spectrum, you have something like That Dragon Cancer. Beautiful game, uh, you know, emotionally compelling, uh, you know, really interesting uh, experience, won, won a lot of awards, uh, but, you know, really to, it wasn't a commercial success. It was a very short, linear experience. Uh, uh, it was a consumable game uh, and, and, and did very poorly uh, commercially. And then on the other other end of the spectrum, I mean, put any uh, Fortnite, League of Legends, Counter Strike, whatever, uh, uh, you have something that is sort of completely designed to be uh, uh, shareable and mimetic and status building, and you know all, all this for, for streamers, all that kind of stuff, and of course, massive success. You know, as indies, we're not all in a position to be making Apex Legends or or Fortnite, uh, so you do have examples in between, right? So Polybridge. You know, that's still a very indie level production. It's still a very tiny team, but it's a style of game that kind of enables more of that sharing, expert play, replays, etc. cetera. Uh, you know, one step up from that, maybe something like uh, Human Fall Flat, right? That game was made by one person, uh, but it is more systems driven, creating unique situations, uh, you know, solving puzzles. It's streamable and shareable, all this kind of stuff. Uh, and was, you know, one, one person. Uh, and had you know massive success and and kind of grew so so there, there, there's definitely a, a range in between um, you know a one hour self-contained experience like a that dragon cancer you know versus the big you know game as a service game so I'm not I'm not suggesting that you have to make Apex Legends have any chance of success. There's a lot of range in between, uh, but really the ends of those spectrums on the one end it's let's call it more film like experiences kind of consumable, as we said before. I play it, I'm done, I put it down, I've consumed it, versus games that are more chess-like or sort of football-like, uh, where they are unique situation generators, uh, where every match, every play session, everything, you, every time you play is different, different strategies, different variables, different resources. Um, and so, uh, y- y- you know, Polybridge is more... Actually, I probably should have flipped them. Polybridge is more chess-like and that I'm trying to solve this sort of puzzle uh, of, of the bridge than it is consumable. Uh, you know, city builders are more chess-like. Uh, all the PvP games are more chess-like. Um, there, there was a great lecture from uh, Jason Rohr at GDC a couple of years ago. Uh, it was kind of an indie apocalypse lecture, but really the lecture was looking at sort of consumable indie games versus unique situation generator games. So a great, uh, a great lecture I would encourage you to check out. Uh, all right, so the last little bit, let's talk about community uh, and and kind of this trap of, of uh, vanity metrics versus true engagement. <clears throat> and I think a lot of the, the discoverability techniques actually require you to properly engage with your fan base and properly engage with your community. It's not just about, you know, how many views of the trailer did I get or how many likes on my tweet did I get. Uh, there's some value in that, but but really it's about doing things to properly engage your uh, your your audience. 
Uh, there's a guy I really like uh, that talks about this stuff quite a bit uh, named Chris Zakowski. Uh, he has a wonderful website called howtomarketagame.com uh, where he does a bunch of blog posts about marketing techniques. Uh, he also does a bunch of stuff around Steam uh, Steam page optimization as well as Steam buyer behavior. And he, you know, he does a whole bunch of number crunching on what's selling and all this kind of stuff. Um, so if you go to that website and click on blog, there's a whole bunch of really interesting uh, posts if you've not already been there. Uh, and I, I've seen a few of his lectures and, uh, and, and there's this concept that I, I kind of really like where he says most game developers are really bad friends in that we work hard to make a friend, right? We go to a show, we're at Ludicious or PAX or you know, we're online and we're kind of telling people we exist and hey, please be my friend. And then someone says, okay, sure, I'll be your friend. And they sign up for our newsletter or they you know, join our Discord. And then we do nothing with that friend, right? We're just like, okay, we've got our friend. They know we exist. And then a year later when our game is finished, it's like, hey, friend, can I borrow 20 bucks? Uh, and we're not sort of working to engage our audience, interact with them throughout that sort of time of, of friendship so that when the game is out and we want 20 bucks from them, it's not so, so jarring, right? The friend doesn't say, well, who, I don't even remember who you are. What, like, where are you coming from? Um, and so I, I thought that just conceptually, that was sort of an important uh, uh, process to think about. Um, and, and, and so Chris sort of talks about the, the sales funnel, which is not a, a, a new concept. Of course, sales funnel is, you know, been around since selling has been around, uh, but really where you're looking at this kind of funnel where you start at the top, where you're making players aware that you exist, you know, then that person is sort of curious and considering to, to, to be a customer to buy your game you know, then, then they download the game and actually become a customer. And then, and then eventually they, you know, ideally become a true fan of you or, mm -hmm. or your studio uh, or, or, or your franchise. And so part of it is sort of thinking about engagement uh, along, along the whole life cycle of, the, of your production, right? This is not something you do at the end when the game is made. This is stuff you should be doing throughout the entire production timeline. So you wanna do this stuff kind of the whole production timeline. And sure, that level of engagement or intensity may sort of grow over time as you get closer to launch, but really this stuff should be starting at the very beginning. Uh, and so quickly, I just kind of want to break down, you know, what that could look like uh, at, at, at the, the different sort of phases of the funnel. Uh, so for awareness, right? You're trying to make people aware that you exist. All right, well, when you're in the conception phase, maybe you're doing art tests on Twitter. Uh, and there's actually been a few, Ooblets was an example of that, where they were kind of just noodling with art styles, putting it on Twitter, getting good reaction, sort of adjusting their ideas around the game, kind of collecting fans, uh, you know, as early as the conception phase. Um, you know, during pre-production, I don't know, maybe you're posting fail videos on, on Reddit of, of like your, your rendering engine, or your physics screwing up or something. Uh, and so people, you know, will come and follow you because they think it's uh, hilarious. Uh, during production, uh, you know, okay, now the game's almost done. So now maybe you're doing press interviews. So it looks more like traditional uh, kind of uh, PR or promotion type stuff. Uh, and then, you know, once the game's out, well, maybe now you're putting the game into all the different awards uh, competitions and festivals to try to, you know, win awards and get extra awareness by being announced as, a, as an award winner. Uh, again, I mean, there's, there's a thousand more things to do here. Just in, this is just sort of super rough example to kind of illustrate. Uh, all right, so now, now we've done a bunch of awareness building. Now we have to think about stuff like at the consideration uh, level. So in the conception phase, you know, maybe now I have a newsletter and I'm making updates uh, and someone who became aware of the game signed up for the newsletter and now they're kind of reading my newsletter and getting those updates uh, over time. Uh, or during pre-production, maybe I'm doing dev diaries uh, on Twitch or running, running kind of blog posts about uh, uh, you know, what, how, how production is coming along and design decisions. The whole point here is that the player or the person is, is still kind of evaluating what you're doing and wondering, is this something I should you know, eventually buy? So they're, they're digging deeper. They're, they're learning more about you as a developer, about the project, et cetera. Uh, you know, uh, the production phase, maybe you're, you're participating in a summer uh, festival like the Steam sale with a demo. So now that person who became aware of the game said, oh, great, that game that I'm curious about, there's a demo. So I'll go up to Steam and grab the demo and check it out. And so now they're sort of digging deeper and considering to, to, to buy the game. And then maybe after I'm doing fan expos or showcases like PAX and stuff to kind of, uh, uh, you know, again, get, get more attention from potential uh, customers. Uh, now someone has become a customer. Uh, 
uh, you know, the conception phase, uh, you know, may, maybe it's super early and they're, they're actually a customer because they're signed up to your Patreon. Uh, or the pre-reduction phase, you know, maybe now they're, they're, they haven't actually bought the game yet, but they've become part of the beta program, closed beta program. So they're sort of in your, in your game already. Uh, the production phase, okay, hey, you're in early access. So now maybe they actually are a paying customer because they've paid for for the game at, at early access and and you know now they're part of your your community, uh, or maybe post uh, uh, you know they're a customer but now they're participating in tournaments or special events and challenges and stuff so they're continuing to engage uh, you know you haven't forgotten about them just because they gave you the twenty bucks you know the game's been released and now they continue to engage in in the game. Uh, and then at the true fan level, I mean, this is maybe a bit harder to think of at the conception phase, but but perhaps it's a, it's a true fan of, of your studio. And so maybe they're a player from a previous game. And so on the new game, they're already there. It's like, I, I, whatever you're going to make, I'm here, I'm in line. Even though you're just concepting it, I'm, I'm, all, I'm already a fan. Uh, Pre-production, you know, maybe they're a Kickstarter backer. So you did a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, at the production phase, you know, maybe they're they're so engaged that now they are a, a volunteer as a moderator on your Discord because they're a true fan. Uh, or, you know, once the game is out and all the tools are out, maybe they're making mods. Uh, so now they're a true fan and they're they're helping produce content for for the game via your your modding system. Again, these are just sort of for illustration purposes. If, if we flip it the other way, again, this is the funnel. Uh, you know, so, so the awareness level, okay, maybe they read about it uh, uh, on Kotaku. They, we do an interview with Kotaku and like, oh, look at this interesting, you know, ninjas in space game or, or whatever. Uh, and, then, and then I've participated in the, in the Steam uh, Summer Festival and so they can download uh, a demo of my ninjas in space game. Uh, and then, you know, I go into early access and they've been sort of studying and you know browsing and now oh they buy the early access so now they kind of cross that line and they're a customer uh and then uh, you know they're such a fan of the game that now that person has become a, a moderator on the on the discord so just kind of a that that, that style of, of flow um the key here is that that planning should be intentional Right? Rather than just sort of, oh, it just happened and by mistake and we had some random ideas and stuff just happened along the way, really the power is in making this intentional, that you are thinking of that sales funnel, you are thinking of, you know, who are the folks you're trying to make aware, who are the folks that are in consideration, who now are your customers, who, who becomes true fans, and then what you can and should do sort of throughout your entire production cycle, and it's not just PR at the end, it's really throughout the whole uh, the whole process. Um, and there's a sort of concept that I'm toying with uh, that I'm calling community milestones, uh, uh, sort of in contrast to production milestones. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a story uh, to kind of illustrate it. Uh, and this story is, is of another uh, studio that we invested in uh, way back in 2013 uh, called Norsefell. Uh, it's a Montreal-based studio, uh, but actually made up of Belgian and uh, French uh, developers who had moved to Montreal uh, years ago. Uh, and uh, their latest game is called Tribes of Midgard, uh, which actually was announced as a PS5 uh, launch title, uh, and they're getting close to, uh, to release now, uh, published by Gearbox. Uh, but they were struggling. They were struggling uh, about, a, well, I guess, a year or so ago um, in that they were pitching to publishers and publishers were saying, hey, a game looks good. I mean, it, it, it's sort of like a Viking uh, survival community style game with its kind of unique art style, uh, really nice game. And publishers were saying, oh, it looks good. Come back when you've made more progress. Uh, you know, say at GDC. All right, so they leave GDC, they go back home, they say, okay, team, publishers think our thing is cool, but we need to make more progress. All right. You know, hey, you make five more weapons, I'll do another level, you create another giant, we'll create some more skins. And progress in their mind was all production progress. And so they just sort of went to work on their various backlog items and sort of made production progress. Uh, then they would show up at uh, E3 and meet all the publishers again. And the publishers say, oh yeah, that's a nice level. Cool, uh, come back when you've made more progress. And so they would go back home and again, like, oh, geez, we have to make more progress. Okay, five more levels, another dragon, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and, and it was just sort of the same thing over and over again. 
And we had a we had a board meeting and they were struggling. They were almost out of cash. They're like, we don't understand. Publishers keep saying it looks good, but come back with more progress. We go back and they keep saying the same thing. And I said to them, guys, it's not production progress they want to see. They want to see community progress. They want to see that players like it, that there's some form of engagement or buzz around it. And so at that point, they had not really been doing any community building or engagement. They had done a little a little bit of tweets and you know the, the casual stuff. And I said, scrap all of your production milestones. The game's far enough along at this point. And, and for the next three months, lay out a roadmap of community milestones. Uh, what does that mean? Okay, you know, within one month, I, you should have a thousand newsletter subscribers and 2000 Twitter followers, uh, you know, 500 new subs to Discord, and you should run a closed alpha test with 500 players. And like, wow, geez, how do we do? I, so I don't know. I don't care how you do it. Like, that's the target. Do whatever is necessary to achieve that milestone. Um, and, and sure, if there's some production tasks, like fix server code or whatever, to enable you to do that, well, of course, the team has to do those things. But it's not just because you're knocking off backlog items. It's because you're trying to achieve those community milestones. Uh, and so they did that for a few more months. And they went from an out-closed alpha test, beta, beta 2. You know, by the time they went back to publishers, they were running uh, closed beta weekends with like 10,000 players. And streamers were streaming the betas. And people were going crazy. And their Discord was active and all this kind of stuff. And then as soon as that happened, they had multiple publisher offers, multiple investors. They had publishers that were fighting to get the deal. They had to turn down stuff. In the end, they went with Gearbox, and also they were they were offered you know PS5 uh, uh, exclusivity and so on. Um, so had they only just been thinking about you know production, one more level, one more skin, like like it would have been a never ending process, and they kind of just would have had had to have pushed out whatever they had because they ran out of cash. But because they were able to sort of pivot their thinking to community milestones. Uh, like that was able to build the momentum and the traction and the buzz uh, that de-risked the project in the eyes of the publishers and say, oh, okay, well, now you've got something that's interesting. Uh, and so uh, that, that kind of unlocked it for them. Um, so as a concept I'm still sort of playing with in terms of what those community milestones were, but I think that's kind of relevant uh, in terms of the thinking around community uh, and, and also that sort of that timeline of, of engagement. Um, and ultimately, I guess what I'm proposing is that when you are doing these design for discoverability things, you are actually designing for true engagement, right? You are thinking about the things that kind of get the players to play and tell their friends and be more engaged and share what they're doing and, and talk about strategy and all those kinds of things. Uh, and so, you know, design for discoverability is not just a marketing trick. Uh, it, it actually, if done well, makes your game a better game, a more fun game, a more engaging game. Uh, as a final note, uh, for those who are not aware of it, I do want to highlight uh, a newsletter uh, from Simon Carlos called uh, Discoverability Land. Uh, it's on Substack. Uh, so if you just do Simon Carlos Discoverability Newsletter, uh, I'm sure it'll be the first thing that pops up. But he, he puts out two to three newsletters a week around uh, discoverability and marketing and steam statistics and you know what's happening on the different stores and and uh, you know case studies and sales numbers and all kinds of stuff so um he, he he doesn't really talk about design techniques in the in this in the way that we've done here today it's more about the sort of number crunching and stats and results and stuff but still super super valuable um, so i hi highly recommend that newsletter for folks that uh, are curious to dig in deeper and with that, uh, that's the end of the lecture. Hopefully you go out and you kind of come up with all awesome ways to engage your, your fans and sort of pull them in and, and turn them into true fans and have them engage with the game. And then you'll kind of be, be rolling in, in, uh, in cash. Uh, all right, so that's the, the, the end of the lecture. Uh, I guess uh, we have a few minutes for uh, additional uh, questions. All right. I can also talk about Swiss chocolate and Swiss gin. <laughs> and yeah, I guess there's a, just unmute yourself since we don't have the raise of the hand uh, feature. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, obviously we went very fast here and we covered a lot of ground. I think, I think the, the challenge for many developers 
is, is, you know, it's overwhelming just to make a fun game, right? It's like, hey, I, you know, I've got my code to do in the art and we're so resource strapped and don't have much time and, you know, money. And, and I'm just trying to make something that's kind of cool. And, 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 that, and that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, the, I, I suppose echoing a bit sort of the stuff that Ella and, and uh, Jamil covered last week, you know, you do have to decide, you know, what kind of success are you going after uh, you know, why are we doing this? What are our objectives? Uh, certainly when I do my advising and lecturing and so on, I, I'm always trying to think of this kind of a, a, a beautiful marriage of, of, of commercial success, but also games that are beautiful and fun and meaningful and innovative and all that kind of good stuff. And like, and like how do you do both things? How do you make an awesome game that also makes a crap ton of money? Uh, that that kind of marriage of the, the art and business side is is definitely challenging. So so that's always my perspective of success does include commercial success, and I and I think that at the root, if you are not thinking about these things, if you're not thinking about discoverability, if you're not thinking about community engagement from day one, then then, then the chance of commercial success is just massively limited. Uh, it doesn't mean you won't create a cool game won't mean that your game won't look good or win some awards. It's just super unlikely that you'll, you know, make money with it. Um, so, yeah, so, so it's like you have to plan in that greater context than just my job's a developer and my job is just to code the thing. Um, so, yeah. I, I would have a question. to see yeah. Attila again. Uh, so, again, as an investor, when you're like estimating uh, this this side of a project are you are you looking for or i would put it in a way that good craftsmanship would be enough for you or are you looking for some crazy cool new innovative ideas in the field of marketing components in the game game design yeah yeah i, I mean Attila, it's a it's a good question and unfortunately good craftsmanship is never enough Right, right, like, like it just doesn't do it, right? I mean, like, like look at, look at uh, Forgotten Anne, right? It was ten on tens across the board, and it won a hundred different festivals and awards. Like, you know, unquestionable level of craftsmanship in the quality, beauty, fun factor, you know, of the game, and you know, it, it sold horribly. Um, so, so that, that, you know, and I invested in that one, you know, we, 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 we learned a lot from that experience. Um, and, inf and unfortunately, uh, no matter how much we wish it, because we are at heart creators and designers and artists and developers, you know, we would hope that the quality would speak for itself. And, and the sad reality is, is that's rarely the case, right? It's the, you know, it's, it's the tree that fell in the forest that no one heard. Uh, and, and, and you have to, you have to do these other things that engage community and, and, uh, uh, you know, leverage Twitch extensions and, uh, uh, you know, encourage folks to share their replays and, uh, you know, have systems that, you know, uh, invite their friends into it because they can kind of advance faster. And I mean, it's, um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not designing these things for gameplay museums, right? These have to succeed and exist out in the world where there's just a flood of content and distraction and noise and, and so on. So, so yeah, unfortunately, uh, you know, a well-made game is the starting point, not the ending point, right? Like, like yeah. yeah, sorry, I, I may have been mis misunderstandable. I'm, when when I was referring to good craftsmanship, I was I was meaning good craftsmanship in 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 these areas, like like the like the community building or or how you integrated with T Twitch. You know, there are several good examples that you can follow and you can implement and you can describe how you would do it in your game. Or do you accept uh, expect uh, as an investor something completely crazy that nobody has ever done before? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's probably a bit of both, right? If, if you have a great game and, and, and sort of well-strategized uh, discoverability techniques implemented or planned, uh, and, and it's like sort of the complete package of something awesome, but also something that has those hooks, uh, you know, that, that, that often is compelling enough. Uh, where, whereas if you also come to the table and say, I've got a trick up my sleeve, which is every famous streamer is going to play this because I, I don't know what I did, whatever, I have some system, 
well, then that, you know, that gets me even more excited uh, because now you have a chance of kind of getting above the noise even more. Uh, but but I, I wouldn't say that that totally bonkers, you know, out in, you know, from outer space, const- like that, that's not a requirement, um, but, uh, you know, c- could be helpful to get more attention. Okay, thank you. The, 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 the concern is the reverse, which is a developer comes to the table with, you know, just a fun game and they haven't thought about any of these other factors. And then it's like, well, I'm sorry to say it till uh, like, like you have a, a nice looking game, but you haven't thought of any of this stuff. So the chance of you getting noticed is very low. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's, that's more the issue is, is, is the developer has only been focusing on making the game as a, you know, just as a game, the game itself. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Other questions last round? Maybe. Yeah, and cer- certainly the, the teams that I've been working with, uh, I mean, we haven't gone through the full taxonomy, but uh, I've already been harassing them <laughs> about, about these discoverability uh, challenges. I, I mean, same thing with the teams from the, from the, last, uh, the last round. So uh, I, I, I never shut up about it. Uh, if, if nobody have any other questions, I would really use this opportunity to talk, talk to Jason. I would have a very uh, specific pragmatic question. Uh, we are thinking about um, uh, using um, services, testing services uh, before going to investors. Uh, as an investor, is, is this value for you? Like go to these services where they have tens of thousands of like community testers uh, mm-hmm. that give a preliminary feedback about the gameplay, but also, you know, it's it's not proper community building, of course, but sort of something like that. Yeah, I mean, doing that is better than nothing. I would prefer if those were your tests. Me, me, meaning like if, if I use the example of Tribes of Midgard, uh, you know, they, they posted a teaser and said, hey, we're gonna be testing our Viking game in closed alpha you know, come sign up and we'll send you a key. And they just hustled like crazy to get the first 500 people to do that. And that was closed alpha one, right? And then, and then that went well, they got a bunch of feedback, you know, test data, uh, uh, you know, input to improve, they found bugs, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then that, that gave them about two, three weeks of work. And then they did a closed alpha two, and they did the same thing. They posted a teaser. It's like, hey, we had 500 people for closed alpha one. If you want to come join us, you know, here's some highlights of, uh, of fights that went down. And then they told all of their alpha one players to invite a friend. Hey, if you have a friend that wants to join the next alpha, we'll send them a key. And so 500, I, mean, I don't think all 500 of the first players invited a friend, but so not only were they doing the you know, outreach and using Twitter and Twitch or whatever to kind of get more testers, but every tester they had was then invited to invite a friend to come test more. And so like closed alpha two was, I don't know, like 2000 players or something. And then, as I said, I think by the fourth test, they were up to like 13,000 uh, players, all, all closed. Like it was all managed keys through the newsletter, given the, out via discord. And, uh, and in fact, I mean, Philomena has done this. They did this with Nimbadas. I mean, they, they've done this before this kind of, you know, tease, sign up for the newsletter, get a key, get invited to Discord. Like it's kind of this, this loop of, of engagement. So, so Attila, I mean, I, I, I would strongly encourage you to do that uh, because at the end of the day, not only do you get the feedback and the test results and discover some bugs and hear what people like, but now you have 10,000 people in your Discord or subscribe to your newsletter or have a build of the game that you're updating. And that's way more valuable than just, you know, paying some dollars for an online test service to manage a, a test cycle for you. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I would encourage you to, uh, to, to ping uh, uh, Philomena and just say, hey, Jason said something about your Nimbatus, you know, sign up demo key test cycle, you know, how did that work for you? Um, and I, I'm guessing she'd be happy to tell you about that. So, so yeah, that, that, that'd be my, my sort of quick advice is, is sort of take that on board because community is actually a really valuable asset from the investor perspective. And if you're like, I'd outsource that just to have some testers out in the cloud, bang on my game and find some bugs. It's like, okay, that, you know, good, but that, but you're not, you're not generating that asset of your own. 
So, so do, do it yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Cool. Okay. All right. Anyone else? I think so, we're done. So I, I guess we're going to close it. Thank you very much, Jason. Very inspiring talk. I loved it. Uh, uh, maybe one one last uh, question from my side to keep this relationship going. What's your most favorite Swiss chocolate? Black one, white one? Oh. Not Le less the white ones. I I'm less a fan of the white ones. Um, actually, uh, 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 Stefano from uh, Stellex uh, sent me some gift uh, chocolates at Christmas. Uh, the team I was working with on the last last round, and it was like you know, hard on the outside and a bit chewy with hazelnut inside. I, it, it was from Ticino, so I think it was, uh, you know, a bit of an Italian influence. I, I don't have the box. I ate them all very fast, so I don't remember the name of the chocolates, but uh, okay. I, I'll, 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 I'll eat all of it. Okay. What about the chins? The chin, uh, Tobio is asking. <laughs> uh, For the more there's... big, big, big relationships, like the long-lasting ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I have I have probably uh, seven or eight different uh, Swiss gins. Uh, one of my favorites is called uh, Edelweiss, which is made by like an old lady up in the mountains, and she makes maybe like a hundred bottles a year. And uh, and one of her gins like won a gold medal uh, last year or like 2019. So on my last trip to Switzerland, I emailed the old lady in the mountains and said, "Can I get a bottle?" Uh, of your gin, I, I heard that it won awards, and so she like brought a bottle down from the mountains and 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 delivered it to. Um, there's a, there's a bar that we've gone to a few times, the the Fortier, Quatre Tier. Do you remember this one? It's like Zurich. Fort, in in yeah. Zurich, yeah. in Zurich, there's there's a really nice gin bar. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't know the name. Yes, what with it was with Ch with Helen, right? Like in old, old towns, right? Probably. Well, I, I mean, I, I've been there like ten times. <laughs> it's it, it's it's more near where the festival is. It's not in the old part. Uh, um, okay. I don't I don't know. Oh, let me see if I can get it. Uh, it's a, it's a beautiful little uh, fortier uh, bar. Uh, Zurich. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, I, I guess I'm saying it wrong. It's four tier tier. Uh, copy link, put in the chat. Uh, <laughs> yeah, everyone's like, "What the hell are you doing?" Getting him talking about this stuff. No, I want to know this. I will. I want to go there. I will go there and try it out. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, look on, on Google Map. It says cocktail bar with huge gin selection. It's near, <laughs> near the Baccarelage Park, mm -hmm. so it's not too far. Mm -hmm. it was walkable from the site of uh, of of the um, dishes, but. Uh, the point was, so the old lady from the mountain brought the bottle down and, and, and she knows the, the bartender of that bar. And so he had it for me and I had to go to the bar, <laughs> collect it. Uh, anyway, so, so uh, one sec, I'll, I'll check. Uh, it'll, it'll waste gin. I'm probably spelling it wrong now. Uh, yeah, whatever. We'll, we'll have to do another webinar just on Swiss. Uh, yes, Swiss. absolutely. Let's do that. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, Jason. <laughs> Thanks, folks. Have a great day because you're much earlier than we are. Uh, and yeah. thank you very much to everyone. And uh, have, a, have a great day or a great night. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Catch you bye later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.